edition of Poems for People Who Hate Poetry. And today we're going to be exploring, and we're going to start today on a series where we're going to be exploring the English Romantic Verse, or Poets. And um, one of the claims that I'm making and going to be making in this whole Poems for People Hate Poetry is that you do not need a PhD, a master's, you don't even need to take a bloody course, not a single course in literature and poetry to really be able to understand and apply the, um, you know, the, the, what happens in poetry when you listen to it, when you read it, when you understand it, how, how you can apply that to your own life and, you know, help you live a better life because of it. And so that's my claim is that even if you're like me, a salesperson, you know, and a, just a normal guy who didn't go to, uh, you know, didn't go to any special school to understand literature or poetry, that you can unlock this poem. And the poem we're going to start with, with the romantics. And I may throw in some, you know, what's called metaphysic poets or some other poets along the way. But I'm, I want to do a series on this for a couple of reasons. One, I think the romantics are the pinnacle of great poetry for a variety of reasons, at least up to my current reading of poems. Two, I think they are the most applicable to human life, to your life living on earth as an individual human being with a certain consciousness that's experiencing the world in a very specific way. I think the uh, romantic poets really understood that. And also it's for my own personal gratification that I'm not, like I said, I don't ever strive to be a, just a specialist in a PhD sense, but I do want to get a deeper and deeper understanding of the art form in and of itself. So I'm going to be, you know, expressing a lot of this and, and the poem we're going to be reading today and conversing with is To the Nightingale by William Cowper. And I'm going to do a couple of things here. First, I want to uh, show you how to read this poem with nothing but your phone. So, you know, you don't need specialized knowledge. You just need to get the, uh, the, dictionary app, preferably the, uh, what version do I have? I was, oh my gosh, the um, Oxford American Dictionary is what I have. I don't think it's the best dictionary I've ever read, but it's better than nothing. So, you know, you need some kind of dictionary. So you need a dictionary and your mind, and you can unlock pretty much any poem. Then after I do a normal, you know, reading, a normal converse with verse, where we go through the poem and then I, um, you know, we unlock a little bit of it and translate it into a language that we can each understand. Then I'm going to unlock it a little bit deeper, again, using mostly the internet and then a little bit of my man, Ovid Metamorphosis, um, which is, so this is where it takes a little bit more of expansion of your you know, uh, mind and knowledge and experience and things of that nature. So we're, there, my argument and what I'm saying of why you should read poetry, even if you're, you know, a door-to-door -door salesman, if you're uh, a teacher of mathematics it, or an engineer or a mechanic, I don't care what you are, or if you're a PhD and how you can actually understand literature and poetry rather than, um, you know, argue that you think you know everything. And this is, you know, my argument for that is, there are layers to understanding a poem and you can understand it on a very superficial level. And then you can go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. And part of it is as you grow as a human, you're going to get better at it. And before I do it, I, I want to put a couple, um, a, a quick word, which I'll probably touch on regularly about the issue that we're all taught. Uh, if we ever approach Art appreciation is the worst idea and course study ever. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, it's, it's a combination of, of ideas. I, you know, for instance, I can appreciate if someone brings me a cup of coffee. Um, but looking at a work of art is not appreciating it. 
Like if you're actually looking at it, you're not appreciating it. That's not the right term to use. You know, I could appreciate, I guess, although I think this is kind of a low level way of thinking about it. I can appreciate that Michelangelo dedicated his life to his craft and could then create these great works of art. Although appreciation seems to be not enough. Reverence is a better term, but I can appreciate that. But when you're looking at just the artwork, and you're just looking at it, man, you know, and you're trying to understand what the poet is saying, what the painter is trying to communicate, what the sculptor is trying to convey, what the architect is trying to impose, what the musician is trying to, to make you feel. When you're in that realm, you want not to just appreciate. And I think why I hate this so much is because it basically schisms off the intellect. And it, it claims that all you need to be a great lover of the arts is appreciation. Uh-uh. You need to have a super fine intellect. I think it is as hard, if not harder, to have a great understanding of a great work of art than it is to have uh, you know, a, a, an ability to construct a Mars rover mission. Now they both are the same, they're both using the intellect, but in fundamentally different ways. And this, my claim is that they're not separate, they're very united in a certain way. And it's important for us not to assume that you have to have some special faculty to appreciate or enjoy, <laughs> I caught myself saying it there, enjoy, understand, um, you know, use your intelligence to know what the artist is trying to say. And those are the types of terms I think we need to use. So that's what we're going to be doing. And that's kind of my claim for this series and really for the whole section of poems, for the whole uh, the thesis behind poems for people who hate poetry is that all you need is this phone and your dick, you know, the dictionary. Okay. So first, if you know my method, my first thing is read the poem. And if there's even a slight tingling of a little bit of understanding or enjoyment or anything, then you need to um, you need to you need to really really dig deep and choose that poem to understand to dig. And you know to dig something you need a tool and don't just use your hands, although that could be effective to some degree. It'd be better to use a tool. And my tool I'm telling you to use is the dictionary. So okay. So we're going to read William Cowper's To the Nightingale, which the author heard sing on New Year's Day 17, excuse me, 92. So it's a pretty short poem. I think there's uh, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six stanzas, very short stanzas. So not complicated. So again, I'm going to read the poem without explaining anything. So if it doesn't make sense, good. Stick with it. It's like exercise. you got to go through. This is what I call just a first fast reading to give you a general sense of the poem. Okay. I'm going to, I don't know why, but I'm going to read from the book. Well, you guys, no, I'll read from here actually. Okay. William Cow Cowper, To the Nightingale. And one, I mean, one simple thing you should know is that a nightingale, um, here's a nightingale. A nightingale is a, um, you know, a bird that sings and, and that's it. That's really what you need to know for this. It's pretty simple. Uh, all right. Where do we get? Okay. To the, um, to the nightingale, which the author heard sing on New Year's Day, 1792. Whence is it that amazed I hear from yonder withered spray, this foremost morn of all the year, the melody of May? And why since thousands would be proud of such a favor shown. Am I selected from the crowd to witness it alone? Sing'st thou, sweet Philomel, to me, for that I also long have practiced in the groves like thee, though not like thee in song. Or sing'st thou rather under force of some divine command, commissioned, commissioned to presage a course of happier days at hand? Thrice welcome, then, for many a long and joyless year have I, as thou today put forth my song beneath the wintry sky. But thee no winter, wintry skies can harm, 
when only needs to sing to make even January charm and every season spring. Okay, so even if you didn't like that reading or that if you didn't enjoy it or quote unquote appreciate it at all, that's fine. I hope you'll stick around for the tools that'll maybe help you enjoy and understand poems that you will do. But I think if you start to unlock it with me, with the dictionary, as I said, and uh, you know a little bit of intellectual work, then it may become a uh, a little bit better of an understanding. Okay. Whence is it that amazed I hear from yonder withered spray, the, this foremost morn of all the year, the melody of May? Now, you know, I know that it can be annoying to hear these whences and thous and these and such, since that's not how we spoke, speak anymore or even read like that anymore. But it, it is something that we had in the past. And so all you need to do is just look up what we're talking about here. So whence basically means from what place, where, you know, where is it coming from? And yonder is simply, you know, it's coming from at, you know, like yonder, you know, they're, they're on yonder hills, right, at some distance. And, uh, you know, withered can be think, thought of as like to what place, you know, kind of like place or, or the uh, state. Although upon reflection, I'm thinking that from yonder withered spray is almost like over there, the, the winter storms is how like withered. I think he's doing a play on words. Now, I didn't get that until I, I read it and really translated several times. So I'm giving you my fifth or sixth translation of this now ahead of time. But I'm, I'm just trying to help you through it, that it does take some iterations to really understand and unlock these great poems. So anyway, we have whence is it? So where is this thing coming from that amazed I hear? So, you know, he... Poets are going to play around with the word order to get because sound, rhythm, meter is more important than syntax. Because the normal way you would say something like this is, um, from where is this amazing song I'm hearing coming from? Something like that, right? Whence is it that amazed I hear from yonder withered spray, this foremost morn of all the year, the melody of May? So Remember, to the nightingale, which the author heard sing on New Year's Day. So this is January 1st. So it's winter, right? The dead of winter. So where's this amazing song I'm coming hearing from, you know, in, you know, I, I see that there's a winter storm coming or something like that over there, this wind, withered spray. And yet the foremost morn, day one of the year, of all the year, and I think the word, I'm just now getting this, by the way. So I'm coming to new conclusions as I'm reading this to you. Uh, but the, the foremost morn is spelled M-O-R-N, which is like morning. But it also sounds, this is why the sound of words, it sounds like morn, like I'm mourning, M-O-U-R-N, like I'm sad. It's the death of something. It's the death of last year. Or maybe I'm just mourning because I'm a melancholy, sad dude, <laughs> um, which with the context of the whole poem kind of makes a little bit of sense. He seems a little sad. Whence is it? So, so I get a picture of, um, so here's what I'm hearing this first stanza as. From where is the amazing song being sung? It sounds as though it comes from the place in my mind during the best time of the year, you know, for the best time of the year. So it's like, he sees, he seems to be stressing the state that the poem puts him in, that this song is putting him in like a state of mind. So he may be like on the balcony freezing, because, you know, he's so miserable, he's just going to freeze. That's what he does. And then all of a sudden, he hears this song, which puts him into a different state of mind. And it puts him into the best of times, which is May, springtime, right? It's the best of times for him in his uh, view. So he's in winter, but the song transports him to uh, May. So th that's kind of, that's my take on the first, you know, stanza there. So, and why, since thousands would be proud of such a favor shown, am I selected from the crowd to witness it alone? He then asks the gods, maybe, or, or maybe the nightingale, the muses, why out of all the men in the world, all the men who would proudly accept the honor of hearing this beautiful song, so why am I, William Cowper, this miserable guy sitting on a balcony freezing my butt off, having had this terrible you know, time in my life, why am I hearing it? And why me alone? Okay, so um, 
now I'm going to the next one. Um, so the the definitions, all the definitions I think you've needed so far were whence, yonder, withered. And you know, I kind of explained what they were. It's like whence is from what place or what source, yonder is at some distance, to what withered can mean like a place or a state, but it can also mean like withered weather, right? Is so play on words. Again, I'm giving you a little bit of the advanced at the same time. But so far, there's not a lot of words that you have to know. You do have to use your mind to write out what you th the translation of what you think he's saying in normal syntactic English. And that will help you, you know, put into uh, a better understanding of the actual poem. Okay, so the third, third stanza. Sings thou, sweet Philomel, to me. For that I also long have practiced in the groves like thee, though not like thee in song. So Philomel, um, I'm going to just tell you, you can look this up, is basically a stand-in for a nightingale. But I want to go into, uh, in a few minutes, a deeper translation or, or understanding of this uh, poem from this word Philomel and what that means. So this is a special word that it's, you can think of it as like the a hint the poet is giving you, it's like a, a puzzle piece. And it's like the, the compass of the puzzle piece. Like if you can understand this one word and poets do this all the time, you know, or at least it, it seems like that today, but it's, it's really just like, it's, it's a special key, right? Like a key on a map or something that unlocks the entire poem or helps you unlock the entire poem the more you think about it. But we're going to reserve that because we're, it's not clear from the dictionary definition of what it is. And you could just get Philomel is Philomela, uh, which is a minor myth it'll tell you in the dictionary, uh, which is a stand-in for a nightingale. So just a minor myth about that. Okay. Um, sing, so basically he's saying, sing to me Philomel, this you know, uh, uh, anthropomorph anthropomorphic woman that turned into a nightingale. For I too have practiced a singing in the groves, though I have not reached your level of mastery in this. So I'm not as good as you, but I've practiced like you and I want to be like you. So now we have this idea of the nightingale is the grand master singer of songs or poet. And Cowper wants to be like that. Cowper wishes to and practices in the groves like a nightingale. So this is one way of looking at nature and uh, you know what the, what he is trying to strive to be is to bring his song to humans as eloquently as this, you know, thing of nature, this, this creature of nature. So, um, okay, now that one, I don't think there's a lot of words you need to know except for Philomel. All right, next one. Um, oh, yeah, my, my little translation is, are you singing by wit of some natural power? Who commands you to predict that the year will bring happier days? Well, that's for the next song. All right. So, or sings thou rather under, this is the poem, or sings, th sings thou rather under force of some divine command commissioned to presage a course of happier days at hand. So there are two words that you probably think you know, or at least one that you think you know, but I think unless you can really define it and put it into like a definition that you write down on a piece of paper, uh, I think you really should try and look it up. So this one I looked up for you. Commissioned is an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or a group of people. You know, um, you're commissioned to go do this. So it's a command, essentially. Presage can mean predict. Oops, why can't that go away? Can mean predict. <laughs> can mean predict or, uh, you know, be a sign or warning that something usually bad is about to happen. But it could just mean neutrally to predict. So it depends how it's being used. You'll have to decide for yourself in the context of the poem which one you think it is. Okay, so as I kind of alluded to earlier, are you singing, this is my definition or translation, are you singing by wit of some natural power who commands you to predict that the year will bring happier days? So, you know, or sing, so is this creature, this nightingale, singing through some force of nature, some command by nature, that it has been given this duty to predict a course of happier days? Now, remember, this is given 
in um, January 1st, the dead of winter, when there's a winter storm right there. And he's saying, so there's about to be this horrible thing coming, but are you predicting in the future? Remember Melody of May, springtime, something joyful in the future? And then he says, uh, the fifth one down here, he says, um, thrice welcome then, for many a long and joyless year have I, as thou today put forth my song beneath a wintry sky. So thrice just means three times. And so it's basically three times I welcome you. I've had a long, bad run of life with so much misery or joylessness and loneliness for years and years and years on end. Hearing you today sing a song I want to sing myself beneath a wintry sky gives me hope. In other words, I think he has a song in his heart, but could not voice it beneath the wintry sky. He didn't want to or didn't feel like he was capable or he was... You know, why is he hearing this song alone? Maybe uh, he sees it now as his duty to do so. It's his nature, like the nightingale's nature. Not till he heard the beautiful nightingale. Now that's kind of given him almost an inspiration. Okay, last one, last stanza. You can't be harmed by winter, right? but the no wintry skies can harm when only needs to sing to make even... Uh, evening, even January charm and every season spring. But thee, or you, but you, no winter skies can harm when all, all you need to sing, is, um, all you need to do, all you needs to sing, which is another way of saying all you need to do, um, when all, all you need to do is sing and you make every January charming and every season, including winter, a spring. So, um, you know, he's saying, I think you can't be harmed by winter as I can. And my life has been a winter. All you require for nourishment and joy is to sing. And I should take heed of that. I should learn from that. I should be like that. I should be like the nightingale and take credence that you're a natural creature who has a song in your heart. I am a natural creature with a song in my heart. So I should sing and bring joy to others and joy to myself. Your song makes January charming and every season spring, and I should be like you. So this poet is a true romantic. He's sitting in winter and lamenting the harsh and severe English winter. When amidst this withered spray or the snowstorm, he hears the melody of May, springtime. Cowper is shocked that he, of all people, can hear this lovely spring, springtime song. He's just a miserable, lonely guy sitting in winter why him? And perhaps he realizes the nightingale is Philomel. We're going to talk about her. And she too, the woman in the myth, lived a miserable life and yet became a nightingale and was given a song that could cheer all mankind. Maybe this winter song is predicting a happy year to come, or it's transporting him from the miserable uh, misery of winter to the happiness and joy of spring, to the life birth budding of new relationships, sex, you know, all the things that you do, family, happiness, all the great things that happen in spring, which don't necessarily happen in winter, or at least not emotionally, if you're in an emotional winter, right? Uh, if that's the case, I'm more than happy to hear her song, and perhaps she can give me a song of my own to get me through the winter. And you will be my minstrel, my inspiration. No winter can stop you, and so if no winter can stop me. No misery of, hum or of human or natural world can make you sad. All you need is your song and in singing every January spring, and I will take heed and inspiration from that. Okay, so that is my little translation of the poem by Cowper. Now, I wanted to quickly go through a, um, a little a brief explanation of why it's so valuable to you to read a little bit of mythology. Uh, it's the, the way to happiness and goodness is through mythology and poetry. I really believe that. There's a, there's a quote I love by um, Bullfinch, who wrote the, the book called, he wrote a book called Bullfinch's Mythology, or just mythology. And it's a great little primer on myth. And in this first paragraph he taught he says 
For mythology is the handmaid of literature, and literature is one of the best allies of virtue and promoters of happiness. Or another way of saying that is to be a good person, you must have mythology and poetry and literature. You need to have it. It's the best promoter of happiness and the best um, ally to goodness, or he calls it virtue, but I think it's very similar in ideas. So let's go, let's really quickly, I'll try and wrap up in a few minutes here. Let's really quickly think about this, I, this person, Philomel, and how that can help you unlock the entirety of this poem. And, you know, because part of what we're talking about here, as I've been mentioning, is the sadness that is this poet's life. And even though that's not, he doesn't say I'm sad, you can get that from the the language he's using, the withered spray, foremost mourn. But then also he, he talks about later, um, you know, commission to presage course of happier days, which implies that he's had Saturdays. And then he says, thrice welcome for many a long and joyless year have I. So that right there tells you that he's been pretty miserable lately and for maybe his whole life. And that then helps you understand the beginning of the poem. This is why it's so uh, critical to read poems over and over and over again, not just once and think you understand it. It's not poetry appreciation. It's poetry intelligence. Okay. So this comes from Ovid, which is a series. A lot of our myths that we know of uh, come from, you know, that we have today come from Ovid or from Homer or Hesiod. And, uh, you know, there's a number of ancient Greek writers who wrote about the poems and or wrote about these myths, put them together. And so it's definitely valuable to you as a human, not as a purely as a plumber, although because you're a plumber, but you're also a man or a woman, right? So as a human, as a man, as a woman, this is valuable to you because like Cowper, you're going to go through bad times. And it's nice if you remember, oh, there's a nightingale and to kind of romanticize that. And that's, that's why I say um, poetry can't solve many of your problems, but it can act as a salve, like a sal, you know, a kind of a, a solution in or a, a like aloe vera on a wound. Okay, so here's the quick story. This is in uh, book six, Tyrius, Procne, and Philomela. So Philomel is short for Philomela, and the basic story is Tyrius is the king of Thrace, is a kingdom in the Mediterranean area. And he marries through an alliance, Procne. And then um, they're, you know, they, they're in love and they uh, are, at least he seems like he's in love. He does a, you know, he, he seems like a good husband. He acts like a good husband to Procne. She's very happy with him. She quote unquote gives him a son, which is what all men want, right? Especially in ancient times when you need to pass on your lineage. And um, his name is Itis. And Procne asks a favor of Tyrius, the king, her husband. She says, I miss my homeland. And my sister, Philomela, is a um, you know young virgin, or she's a young unmarried woman, and she still is free to kind of come here before she has to go to a, a man. Remember, this is ancient, ancient Greece, and it's a myth. So, you know, this, this don't apply a social justice warrior to this stuff. Obviously, this is just they're living in a certain context. So she asked Tyrius to go ask the father if he can bring her, the sister Philomela, to Thrace to spend some time with Procne and to meet her grandson or her uh, nephew before she's going to get married and, you know, have to deal with her own things. So Tyrius says as a quote unquote, kind of foreshadowing here, some, uh, a good husband. So he goes and then he sees Philomela in her home, in the homeland and he gets lustful. And it's, uh, Ovid is very uh, snarky about this to some degree and says that it's just part of the Thracian. They're full of passion and they're, they, they always let their passions take over them which, you know, is racist, but it's, uh, but the idea of your passions taking over is, is something that is universal that we all have to struggle with. And, you know, he, obviously you're going to know that he's going to let his passion get a, a, the better of him. So he convinces, Tyrius convinces the king to let Philomela go home to Procne and to, um, you know, or to go to Thrace to meet Procne and, and spend some time with her. But 
he uh, Tyrius, when he lands on Thrace, drags her into a cabin and says, I'm going to rape you and because I want you so bad. His lust has been growing and growing, and so he rapes her. And this, after she comes to and she starts to think for herself a little bit, this is what she says. She tears her loosened, and this is from Ovid. She tears her loosened hair. She beats her breast, wild as a woman in mourning, crying, Oh, wicked deed, oh, cruel monster, barbarian, savage. Were my father's orders nothing to you? His tears, my sister's love, my own virginity, the bonds of marriage? Now it is all confused, mixed up. I am my sister's rival, a second-class wife, and you, for better and worse, for better and worse, the husband of two women, Procne, my enemy now. At least she should be. Why not have been my murderer? That crime would have been cleaner, have no treachery in it. And I, an innocent ghost, if those on high behold these things, if there are any gods, if anything is left, not lost as I am, what punishment you will pay me later soon? Now that I have no shame, I will proclaim it. Given the chance, I will go where people are. Tell everybody. If you shut me here, I will move the very woods and uh, rocks to pity. The air of heaven will hear, and my God, if there is any God in heaven, will hear me. So she, she does this wild lament about this deed that Tyrius did, this horrible deed. And what she basically says is, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to tell everybody. And you notice that her, her reasoning is, you know, you've made me a second wife, which in the ancient, ancient times that you know she lost her virginity, it was going to be impossible or difficult for her to ever find a husband. So this deed, he broke the laws of men and God, essentially, by doing this rape. He broke the laws of the marriage vows he made. He broke the laws of the promises he made to the father. And he broke the laws of virginity and you know what the sacredness of that virgin meant at his time. And, you know, and of course, the laws of her own self, that she didn't have a choice in all of this. And so he broke every law of man and God that you can in this, in this interaction. And therefore, you know, there's new things he would have to be taken into consideration. Like now she is automatically a second wife, is what she said. So, and worse, she has to be the, the, um, the enemy of her sister. So he's, because if, let's say she gets pregnant, well, who's going to take care of her? And now, you know, who's going to inherit the uh, the estate, which was a big deal back then, right? So, because otherwise they would all die and their kids would be, you know, left to destitute to die. So they needed that. And that was a big part of it. Now he's got two women who's going to get it. So now Pro Pro Philomela is a second wife and she needs to, you know, it's in her best interest at this point to usurp her sister whom she loves and wants to spend time with. That's why she came, Procne. So here's what happens. I'm going to show this image. So what happens next is he, because she says she's going to tell everybody, Tyrius, in his horrible way, breaks even more laws and is even worse of a person. And he um, he decides to tear out her tongue. So he tears out her tongue and she can't talk and he keeps her in this cabin. But she, Philomela, after a while, after about a year staying there, she puts together a cloth that has the story of what happened to her, finds an old woman, gets the old woman to take it to her sister, Procne. Procne is enraged at learning what happened through this cloth because that's the only way she can hear the story. She goes to Philomela. They hatch this plan to, um, to kill Itis, the son of Procne and the son of Tyrius, and feed it to Tyrius, the ultimate of uh, sacrileges. You can't get worse than that to feed to a father his own beloved son. And so they do this, and this is the vengeful spirit of nature. That's what women tend to represent. They're the vengeful spirit of nature. You, you know, usurped and you know, destroyed the natural law, therefore you will be punished. And the, he is punished, right? And now he's so angry, so infuriated that he grabs an ax and chases them and then these women are, again, turned into a natural thing. Um, Procne is turned into, I think, like a red robin or, or uh, I can't remember, what is it? Um, she's turned into some bird. And then, depending on the the translate or the, the storyteller of the myth, Philomela is turned into a nightingale. And she's given back her voice. And this time, a song. 
Now, does that at all help you with the poem uh, that we just read? To understand the story of Philomela, that she was raped, wronged, na nature was turned on its head, and yet she got her song back. And I think if you read this again, you know, where is this amazing, like in the depths of hell, you can still hear this, the melody of May. And I think that is the purpose of this poem. That is what the poem is to the author, and it's why it is romantic. So I will, I'll see you next time. Um, and thank you for joining me. I'm going to try to do these on a regular basis, one every day or every other day to the best of my ability. So stick around. You're going to hear a lot of great romantic poetry.